My name is Danny Wood. Fifty years ago, I was a young boy living with my parents in southern Mexico. Like most seven-year-old boys, I didn't have a care in the world. Every day was an adventure. My parents, John and Madge Wood, were missionaries faithfully serving the Mexican people in this region. Tragically, they were taken from my four brothers and me in a plane crash in 1964. This slideshow is the story of our family's return to southern Mexico to celebrate our parents' life and legacy 50 years later. We traveled to Ometepec, Mexico, a city known as a place between two mountains. For us, it was home. Well, we all made it, 28 of us standing in front of the house built by my mom and dad. Currently, my brother Tim lives here with his wife Barb and family. He has continued the mission's work of my parents. We have seen each other throughout the years, probably Van a little less than the rest, but to get all of us together at one time doesn't happen too often. Kenton, Kenton Wood, here's our brother Danny, he's the older brother. You can tell. Yeah, Looking right. No. But Second I remember line. climbing the mango tree as a kid and eating mangoes up there for hours. I just found this out from Ellen Wing. Yeah. That Dad gave Mom a bathtub for her birthday. Oh, really? Back when we were in Sitakwa. Yeah. And they brought it here because yeah. she wanted to have a bathtub. And so to bathe us boys, she'd fill up the bathtub with water. <laughs> and then the, the cleanest one got in first. Yeah. <laughs> And the well, dirtiest definitely one wouldn't be Benji. <laughs> My far, he, he was booger face, as I remember. I was always he was working. always That's the last guy, for sure. I was always working. Thank you for uh, the, the great travels that we've had and the exciting uh, time to get down here and um, meet together as this uh, huge Wood family here and uh, remember the legacy of our mom and dad. So when my parents came to uh, Mexico uh, with the Southern Presbyterian Church, uh, they were supported by about 30 churches out of the southeast part of uh, the United States, Kentucky and Georgia and Tennessee, and uh, many of those churches uh, uh, still have people there who remember them. So they were sent by the Southern Presbyterian uh, denomination along with Jim and Marguerite Boyce. The Boyces, uh, uh, Jim Boyce had already been in Guadalajara for a while, going through medical school, trained as a doctor here in Mexico. And so I, uh, no doubt the mission board felt what a great way to send uh, two couples into southern Mexico, Ometepec, uh, to be missionaries, one to bring physical healing as a doctor and the other one to uh, bring spiritual healing as a pastor. And uh, together uh, they collaborated in this es essence of, of kind of helping uh, to come bring uh, God's word and heal the whole body mind, body, soul, and spirit. It's not the churches that they started or anything like that, it's just who they were. Because they were warm, they were outgoing, they were friendly, uh, they received people in our home here all the time. Our home was always open to new people. See, love is talking about spending time with people, talking to them, listening to them, caring about them, helping them. When they, they needed clothes, my parents all their life, they would even give our clothes away to the kids. We had little little kids sleeping in our beds, using our bath, they'd pee in the bathtub because they'd never seen a bathtub before. There were five of us boys around the table when we ate, and so that makes seven at the table. And if there were only seven, we would always say, well, where is everybody? Because we at least had another three people eating with us at the table. It was ne never just a family, it was just a family. We just didn't know where everybody was. I know that my father was a missionary and a pastor, uh, a builder, my mom accompanied him in the work that he did. Uh, it was a team effort. They would go uh, to a village and uh, he'd hold a service, play his accordion, speak. She would uh, do like a Sunday school, teach children. Uh, so I know that kind of was their mission. There was a 15 minute plane ride to 
go to the villages, but it was a two-day walk, uh, impossible to get there by vehicle. So how do you make contact with these villages? How do you know people? So obviously the hospital was ministering, the purpose of the hospital obviously was to minister to the medical needs of the people, but it was to open up so we'd be accepted. Because here we are foreigners, and we're Protestants, we're evangelicals in a very Roman Catholic area, totally rejected. What did we have that they would accept? Medical help, because they didn't have any. So the hospital really opened the doors to people so that they saw we came to do good. I think that's very important, you're a community player. You come to serve the people. And so that really was what helped open up the area so my father could visit the villages by the people that he met here at the hospital, then he would have a chance to visit them in their villages. Uh, my father realized that he needed a plane was because we couldn't reach these villages by walking to them. It'd take too long to do that. And the plane was the answer because all of these villages had a small airstrip. People, this being the center, commercial center of the area, people would fly in here for medical reasons, they'd fly in here for commercial reasons. And we had about 10 airplanes, small airplanes at the airport here, it's just a dirt runway. And they were like taxis. They, they put, you put chickens, pigs, cargo, anything on them. In fact, sometimes they didn't have seats on them because they just throw all the stuff in and you just sit anywhere you could. And these were the taxis that took these 10, 15 minute flights. They'd go from one town to another town. You know, seat of the pants flying. That's all, that's all basically this was here. And so uh, this was a way that my father was able to communicate with his villages was by going by plane. I used to go with my father to the villages. I played hooky from school. We had seven, I went up to seventh grade, uh, Calvert's Correspondent School. My mom was a teacher. We had school right here in the house. And uh, so I would hop in the Jeep truck, go out to the airport and, and hiding in the compartments. Hop out, Dad, can I go to the village with you? Oh, I got an extra sandwich. I guess you can go along with me, but your mother won't miss you much, I guess not. I used to run, I ran away a couple of times. And I came back one time and said, Mom, did you notice I was gone all day? No, where, you've been gone all day? I'm not gonna run away from home ever again. It's no fun, you didn't even notice I was gone. <laughs> Uh, he had uh, a church here in Ometepec that he did the same thing and I, I have faint memories of attending church, going to Sunday school, seeing my father either preach or play his accordion. I probably remember being around my mom more when she did Sunday school and the other women who helped with Sunday school. When they first came to town there was a lot of suspicion. Um, uh, Roman Catholicism in Mexico is very different than Catholicism in the U.S. Uh, here, uh, there's a sense, uh, there's a real sense of power around it, and uh, and ownership. And so, uh, I think they were uh, the people of the town, the priests, the Catholics were very threatened by a Protestant minister coming to town. One place called Huchitan. Uh, he went in the little Piper Cub, three passengers. Kent and I and my dad went to there. On the edge of town, seven ladies met us with big sticks. And they said, we're not going to let you through because the priest says if we don't, if we let you through, they won't baptize our kids and they'll go to hell, so we can't let you through. I ran behind, I was seven years old, I ran behind them, pulled the sticks, two, two sticks out of the two of the ladies' hands, and the rest of five were going to hit me with sticks. And my dad stood in front and said, you have to deal with me before you touch my kid. And so the dad protected us and they let us through that time. I do have a memory of coming in one morning, must have been when I was six or seven, and uh, coming in and sitting on his lap while he was working. Um, the, well, one thing I remember of my, my father, um, he had hands kind of like mine, and as I get older, my hands look like his. He had very definitive veins coming across his hands, across the top of his hands, and uh, uh, kind of like, like those. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, for some reason, that sticks in my head. I, that what sticks in my head is climbing up on his lap and, uh, and seeing his hands, you know. And, uh, and for a man, you know, it, it's uh, kind of your hands that you get stuff done with, that you work with. And I know that my father was um, a strong man, a uh, very adventurous uh, guy. Uh, he flew airplanes. He drove Jeeps. I mean, I think he just kind of made things up as he went because you're always kind of trying to figure out how to do stuff. And so um, I think he was, uh, he was a kind of man who uh, relished adventure. Yes, when the Wood family gets together, there's always adventure. Not only are we here to celebrate the life of my parents in Ometepec, we are here to celebrate life.
Tim and his family have just finished up a beach camp with local youth from around Ometepec. This has been a nice little lagoon. Every, um, every year it changes its bottom depending on the storms and everything that takes place. And one of the fun things was oftentimes my father, um, every day they'd go out and visit villages in an airplane. And um, I can remember he'd visit two villages in the morning with another team of three other Mexican couples and workers and two villages in the afternoon. And I'd go in with them oftentimes in the afternoon. And we'd sit in these little Bible studies and it was always, I always wondered why he'd make a circle around the town before he landed the airplane on a pasture field. And then I, now as a pastor, I've realized one of the problems is people getting there on time and knowing you're there. And as you give Bible studies, you realize nobody comes until, they, until you have arrived. Nobody's there waiting for you to arrive. And so by making the turn around the town, spin around town before he landed the airplane, just kind of let everybody know I'm here. And um, so it's like ringing the bells, you know, to church. Here we make it. <laughs> okay, let's do this. One. The neatest things I learned from my dad was faithfulness. Just be faithful. You know, there are moments in life where <clears throat> things get kind of tough. And being faithful with, before the Lord and everything brings great rewards. Oh my, my mom was an awesome lady. My wife says many times, I can't live up to half of what your mother was. She was not only ran the whole house, a tremendous wife, tremendous mother, um, teaching us a s school, teaching the Sunday school. She made all the material for the children, for on all the, all the place, all the villages we went to. And then she would go and teach too, of course, too, and train up other people who would take her place and teach. And so my mom was just an awesome lady. She would do things more. Many people said your dad and mom were so close that it was impossible for one of them to die without the others. You know, you'd think it's tragic that uh, they die, and I know I was seven years old when they died, and um, I think at seven you don't really realize what has happened. It's not till you get older that you begin to understand uh, the loss um, that you've had, uh, not having a mom and dad. But God has been faithful, he really has. Um, he's taken care of each one of us, watched over us, protected us, guided us, and given us a real mission and purpose in life. And um, I'm deeply grateful to my parents uh, for what the, for the example they set for each one of us. And I believe we're carrying on that legacy. There was a man who was born decades before my parents, someone who they never met, but his story greatly influenced mom and dad's lives and shaped their ministry. He was a British naval officer, and his name was Captain Reginald Carey Brenton. Captain Brenton uh, came to Mexico in 1892 at a request of Porfirio Diaz, who was the president of Mexico, and he asked Queen Victoria at, who would send somebody to help form a school for the naval officers. And Reginald Carey Brenton was a much decorated British officer, so he was sent over here, and he so happened to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, he took command of the Saragossa ship, which had been built the year before in France, in memory of the discovery of America, 1492, the 400 years. And so this ship took uh, 90 cadets on board and Captain Brenton captained that ship on a year round trip around the world for all the festivities for the discovery of America for the 400 years. Then he came back here to Mexico and he set up the school in Acapulco. And according to the annals, part of his instruction, which was met with a lot of resistance, was that they have Bible studies because Captain Brenton said, you cannot be a leader of men unless you know the word of God and know what it means to be a man of God. So that was part of the instruction. And he had a five-year contract. So in 1897, 
uh, Captain Brenton finished his contract and returned to England. Apparently, during those years from 1897 until 1918 when he came back here, he apparently may have been doing missionary work in Spain. We're not sure. Then he showed up here in 1918 as a coal porter for the British Bible Society. So he had a donkey named Catalina and he loaded that donkey up with Bibles and he would go from town to town preaching the Word of God and selling his Bibles and that's basically his means of sustenance. My folks moved to Ometepec. In fact, when I was born is when they came to Ometepec in 52. And it was kind of interesting um, because as they were opening up ministry, making contacts, making friends, one day a gentleman showed up at their doorstep and he was a town dentist and he had a newspaper wrapped a Bible. And that Bible was Captain Kerry Brenton's Bible. In 1921, Captain Brenton began what would be his final trip. He started from Acapulco and he was heading south along the coast going towards Pinatepa. And uh, he arrived here in March of that year and uh, rented a house here in town and uh, was very ill at that time. Lord Jesus, I do look up to thee. My folks had lived here for probably about two years and they decided they needed to buy some property and build a house. Started walking around Ometepec. Well, downtown Ometepec, things were expensive and nobody really wanted to sell to the foreigners. But on the edge of Ometepec were pieces of property. And as they walked around, my mother looked at this hill and she says, you know, I want to build a house on that hill. And there was a big old tree right here in this area, right here, it was a nuka tree. She said, I want to put my house underneath that tree. Lord Jesus, I ask for my loved ones and myself. May we constantly abide in thy love. He would climb every day up on a hill and sat under a tree. And after the house had been built probably a couple years, a gentleman came up and said there used to be a foreigner. They used to stand underneath that tree. He would just sit there and be quiet. And he'd look over this whole town and he'd ask God to send missionaries to the western coast of Mexico. That the gospel may be given to West Mexico and many be saved. So you must be the answer to his prayers because you're living on the very hill that he prayed that people would come. Lord Jesus, we thank thee. We are not forgotten. We realize that Captain Britton used to come and pray underneath this tree, looking, overlooking over at the peck like we're looking right now. You know, the town down here, God send missionaries to this area of Mexico. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers and accept our praises. Uh, the schedule today, as it stands right now, is uh, we drive to a river. A number of us are going to go down the river. Uh, on canoes. Now there are 18 of us and I think there are um, six canoes. So it's going to be interesting to see how we end up. And then uh, we're going to stop along the way somewhere and we're going to climb up uh, a mountain to some Aztec ruins. And uh, they go back down. <laughs> Say the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's so many dimensions to being in the wood family. Um, it's been a real, real blessing, really, uh, growing up with Christian parents and uh, such a big this network of uh, Christian community. And uh, as we've kind of seen here, this reunion, um, our grandparents did something, did something right with the five brothers. And, uh, I've just kind of seen how all of them. Are just really, really good dads. And just really um, like spending time with their kids. Coming together at, with uh, all five families, there's just a sense of connection. Um, you, you think, you would think that families that live so far apart, you know, there would be the sense of, you know, trying to work into. It's, it's really cool to get all the woods together and watch how they, I mean, we just bond together pretty, pretty amazingly and I think it's just because we're all, we're all woods. We're all so much like our, our dads and our dads are so, you know, just have such strong personalities. Such a strong, passionate family. 
don't have any emotional memories of mom and dad, which is kind of a bummer. When I started realizing <laughs> um, what I missed was, was when I had kids. It was, uh, it was when my kids were starting to interact with me. And um, I started realizing that that is what I missed out on. And that was tough because growing up, you don't know that. You don't know what you've missed because you, you, all you know is what you've got. And I'm sure that's what a lot of people's lives are. You know, they get their families get divorced or whatever. But in, in the Wood family, it was really interesting that every time I came back down, I got to see the legacy of my mom and my dad. And it kind of was, it was heart touching and all. But it wasn't until my kids were two, three, four, and five, and I saw pictures of me with my dad, him holding me, and then I realized, wow, that's what I missed out on. That's what I would have loved to bet. And uh, that's um, that's where it hurt the most was when um, I didn't get to have the family. Uh, God has been good. He's given me three great boys and a great wife. And I've been able to enjoy that family that I missed out on. And um, I think uh, I, had, I had a 50th birthday party and um, my kids got to talk. And uh, they were growing up. Yeah. And they talked about their childhood and uh, how much fun it was to run up at Christmas time and to sneak into the living room and and or or when we told them to go to bed and they'd come out and they would hide and they would run back and they'd be they know I was looking watching them um, that was so cool because that was me being their dad and me growing them up and that was what I missed out on but they got to give it back to me in a, in a different way and it was pretty cool As the youngest child of the youngest brother of the family, there's no way you can go back home now after a family reunion, which for us, it's, it's way more than that. It's not like, oh, you know, I spent time with my family. It was a great bonding experience. But it's, I got to reminisce on the, the legacy, learn more about the legacy, and going back home, using what I've learned, taking the understanding of my grandparents and applying that to my life. And when I go back home, just to to make them proud and, and to continue what they've started, even if it doesn't mean in Ometepec where they began it, but to say like, okay, I'll make wherever I'm at, that's my Ometepec and that's my f mission field. So it's uh, January of uh, 1964 and um, about halfway through the month, uh, not sure the reason, it, I, I, I think there's probably an annual conference in Mexico City of the National Presbyterian Church and uh, my mom and dad are going to attend that and uh, of course my dad's gonna fly his plane up there he and my mom together and uh, you know not far from the wood house just about two miles from here was the old dirt runway and when dad would take off you'd hear it he'd go over the house and, and take off they left on a Monday and as I think about it uh, it was Monday uh, January 13th there was four of us boys here. Uh, there was Van and Tim, myself and Benji, and Kenton was at a boarding school in the United States. That Monday morning, <laughs> I remember that uh, Benji had gotten a bunch of gum stuck in his hair, and my mom cutting the gum out of his hair uh, before she left uh, in the back bathroom. Funny memory that I remember. And uh, so they flew out of here and my uh, mom said, hey, we'll be back Thursday, January 16th. And as a seven-year-old, you know, you don't really think of days or days of the week. You just know mom and dad are coming back end of the week, Thursday. And uh, one thing that my dad would always do when he would fly out to a village uh, to go do work, on his way back in, he would always fly over the house one time. 
And then uh, <laughs> he would land at the airport and the flying over the house thing was the, the signal for someone to come pick him up. So my mom would get in the Jeep and she'd drive and pick him up or, or Beto, the, the, the guy here who worked here. But it was a signal. So Monday goes by, Tuesday goes by. We're, of course, doing homeschool or running around town. I think the maid probably is taking care of us. And so Thursday rolls around and um, uh, you're, uh, you're waiting to hear how the plane. You're waiting to hear the airplane come over the house because that's the signal that they're back and they land. So you know it's probably not going to come till late afternoon. They're flying all the way from Mexico City and it's a clear day. It's a nice sunny day just like this one. And um, uh, so you know late afternoon comes and there's, there's no airplane. And uh, then it's uh, later in the day and finally the day ends and it's dark. And um, so we have no idea why they didn't fly back in. You know, the thought is, uh, you know, I'm sure Van or Tim said something like, you know, they probably decided to stay an extra day or maybe they flew to Acapulco to pick up supplies and they'll come in on Friday. So you really don't think about it much. It's kind of like, oh, mom and dad are delayed. You know, never been, it's, it's not like you don't picture not having mom and dad. So Friday rolls around, we're home, uh, doing a little homeschool deal. And uh, uh, later in the morning, uh, Jim Boyce pulls up in his Jeep in front of the house. He gets us four boys to come down and we all get in the Jeep. I remember driving up this road that goes up to the hospital in his Jeep, um, a little dirt road. We're sitting in his little Jeep and he turns to us and he says, um, Uh, your dad and mom um, crashed their plane yesterday and um, they both died. Uh, they're not coming back. I think for Benji and I, he's four and I'm seven, uh, that realization doesn't really hit us. For Van and, and Tim, they're a little older, uh, that understanding of death not coming back, that sinks in, this idea that, uh, uh, that it, it's over. But for Benji and I, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, especially for Benji. I. Um, I know we came to the Boyce's house, we, we stayed there, uh, well, we basically moved in there. But I remember staying there for the first day or two um, and, uh, and, and having nightmares at night. Uh, Marguerite Boyce coming in and uh, sitting with us or trying to calm us down or whatever because um, you don't know what that means except your mom and dad aren't, aren't there. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then it's just a flurry of, of stuff going on. Um, my brother Kenton flew back from uh, the US. Other missionaries from Acapulco and Mexico City that I had seen once or twice came into town, the Hamiltons and, and others, and people began to uh, take care of us. Um, I remember going out to the airport when the The big DC-3 flew in, landed at the little dirt runway. They unloaded the caskets. Uh, my mother's casket was blue. Uh, my father's casket was gray. I remember, I, I remember watching the men unload those. And then um, they, they brought them to the house here and they had a service out in the backyard. Um, but Benji and I were very detached from that service. It's kind of like we were there, but we weren't there. It's kind of like, I remember people taking us in the house and saying, do you want to sit and play or your stuff you want to do? And, and you're torn between, I don't know what just happened. I don't know what's going on. 
but I know uh, life is going to change completely. So then, uh, uh, big service, and they were buried. And, um. So we were here for about six months. My aunt, uh, uh, Marge, and uh, uh, came and picked us up here in uh, Ometepec, and we, um, the four of us, got in a, a vehicle with her. We drove uh, to Acapulco. I think we spent the night there, and we flew out of Acapulco back to the United States. The reason it's so significant, it was uh, June 29th. It was my eighth birthday that we, we left Mexico. I wonder what our lives would have been like because in a sense we lost uh, a life or family because our, I have never been, we have never been close as brothers because we're, we're always in separate places. You know, we've just kind of looked for our own way. We just tried basically to survive each of us on our own. It's probably until I was 18 or 19 years of age, I wouldn't even talk about it because if I talked about it, I cried. And um, later on, I've been able to talk about it, although tears still come to your heart and your voice breaks up. But um, so I think that's part of why my brothers coming together kind of was something that, you know, we're able to share back memories that we have hid because they are so painful. Dad actually built that well, had that well built. Oh, is that right? So everybody kind of knows in the neighborhood, those yeah. that know, know that he built that well. You know what uh, is pretty amazing? We still have the old letters that uh, mom would send to Kenton when he was in uh, Ben Lippin. And if you read those letters, I don't know who has them now. Maybe we still have them. But he'd, she'd write, okay, your dad landed here and he hit a cow on the plane and he bent the prop. They're waiting for another prop. I remember walking through the town, whether it was with my mom or some of my other brothers, uh, we really stuck out uh, because we were we were we were towheads. We were really blonde, really blonde when we were little kids. And as I would walk down the sidewalks, uh, as women walked by, they would always touch my hair. So I think that's why I'm missing so much hair now. I, I they probably really touch Van's hair. I can't remember why he's lost so much, but I do remember that we were definitely definitely gringos, as they called us. Um, but, you know, you're here for a lot of years, you kind of become part of the town. They, everybody knew us, and we were the, we were the towheads, the little blondes. Uh, he'd, he'd preach, and they would do some singing, Sunday school. Yeah. I think only in eternity will we truly know the impact of um, John and Madge. Uh, we walk the streets down here, we see the impact by meeting different people whose lives have changed because of it. We gather around here, we all look at each other, we know our lives are changed because of these two people. Um, and then we each have our own communities that we live in, starting with our own families and then going out from those families to others. Um, and I think uh, someday, when, uh, when we get there, we'll look around and uh, people will say, hey, you know, it was because of this or because of that. And it comes back to, for us at least, it comes back to these two who heard the call way back then in the, in the 40s to go, like thousands of others heard the call and they were obedient. We're, we're involved in a great cause, a great purpose, a great mission, a great adventure. And these two were the, uh, the pioneers of that great adventure who've left that DNA in us, that little seed that says, hey, you're here for more than just what the world offers. You're, you're part of a greater mission and purpose. Things that you should know Don't 
let go I pray for you Just pray for me Don't ever forget to believe So hold it in I'll see you then This doesn't have to be the end Be the end Tomorrow comes We'll rise again Tomorrow comes We'll rise again Tomorrow comes Love is the greatest force there is. Love takes away the hate. You overcome evil with good, and love is the greatest thing. And one more thing. My parents are buried in a place of honor in the Ometepec Cemetery, right next to Captain Brenton. Years ago, we noticed that Dad was born exactly nine months after Carrie Brenton died. You know what they say about no coincidences with God. <laughs> 